everyone, and welcome to Discussions in Depth Psychology. I'm Bonnie Bright, and this series, which is powered by Pacifica, is dedicated to bringing you discussions with some of the individuals who are making really important contributions to the field of depth psychology. And today, I'm really pleased to have as my guest Dr. Joseph Cambry, who is the new president and CEO of Pacifica, and also a union analyst. Thanks for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to me today, Joe. Always a pleasure, Bonnie. Well, it's really great to have you here, and I'm really excited to dig into a little bit about what's been happening at Pacifica and what's going to be happening at Pacifica, and also we'll be looking at the role of depth psychology in the world today. Uh, Pacifica has obviously brought so much contribution to the field and is making depth psychology so much more available to people, maybe than it's ever been. And I just feel like from my own education there and also from the many, many people I know who are involved with Pacifica in so many ways that it's such an absolutely critical organization in contemporary society. So we will go there in just a moment. Let me first just read your bio so that everybody has some background on you and then we'll jump in. Joe Cambry, PhD, is president and CEO and also still in his role as, as provost at Pacifica Graduate Institute, I guess for just a little while longer, Joe. He was also serving as vice president of academic affairs there as well. Dr. Cambry is also a union analyst, as I mentioned, and he's past president of the International Association for Analytical Psychology and former U.S. editor of the Journal of Analytical Psychology. And for years, he was on the faculty for the Center of Psychoanalytic Studies at Harvard Medical School, where he co-taught a year-long course on becoming a supervisor. His numerous publications include the book based on his Fay lectures, Synchronicity, Nature, and Psyche in an Interconnected Universe a volume edited with Linda Carter, Analytical Psychology, Contemporary Perspectives in Union Psychology, and a two-volume compendium on research in analytical psychology, co-edited with Christian Rosler and Leslie Sowen, which is currently in publication. In addition, Joke has published numerous papers in a range of international journals. So again, thanks for being here, Joe. You know, I, you and I did an interview, gosh, it's been probably over a year ago, now and so I'm hoping that some people will be interested to go back and check out that interview if they haven't heard much about it or haven't had the chance to see it or listen to it yet. We spent a lot of time actually talking about synchronicity and your role as a supervisor in depth on that particular interview. As I mentioned today we'll be spending a little more time maybe more generally on depth psychology but also specifically on Pacifica. So first of all just a huge congratulations on your your new role there. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, it's very exciting for me to see this happening. I have long been a huge fan of yours, and I, of course, just really love Pacifica and what they are doing in the world. And so maybe we can start by talking a little bit about how you came to be where you are now. Maybe, maybe you can share, what was your initial interest in becoming involved with Pacifica? How did you come to your new role as president? The start really begins about 2010 when um, a friend of mine who was here, Pat Katsky, had asked me to come and do a bit of adjunct teaching in, the, in one of our programs here, the depth psychotherapy program. And so I started doing that, and that was a very eye-opening and, and really pleasurable experience for me. And so from that period, I, I would come out at least once a year for those courses. And then at, in August of 2013, I was able to, I finished up the role as president of the IAP and had a little bit more space in my schedule. So I was asked to do some consulting here at Pacifica and and did that mostly via telecommunications. And then it evolved that I was offered the provost position and I came in August 2015. And I did that largely because of the opportunity to pick up the new directions in depth psychology. As as the president of the IEP, I got increasingly interested in the diversification that was happening on the worldwide stage in terms of analytical psychology. So it moved out of its original homes in, in Switzerland and, and the other key cities like London, and New York, and San Francisco, and Los Angeles. As it started to really enter into these other communities, the uses of analytical psychology began to change pretty dramatically, and it was absolutely fascinating. So there was a merge of that kind of interest with some of the new directions Pacifica was going in. And we've been cultivating that over the last couple of years. Then in February of this year, 
Steve Eisenstadt, the chancellor and president, finally took a, a, a much needed long, um, long put off sabbatical. And I served as acting president during that period. And we launched then, with everyone's input and interest, we launched the search for a new CEO president. And I was the candidate who was chosen out of that. So that's how I ended up in this position, you know, sort of the, the, the formal pathway. I think uh, as a matter of a path of the heart, uh, it really was a kind of growing love affair that began to develop, starting with the editing, teaching, and, and more and more, seeing the potential of it here and really wanting, um, it's such a unique place that how to give it an even larger place on the world stage. That's been one. Absolutely. I, I love the idea of that you know, depth psychology in general, having a larger place in the world stage, and, and of course, mm -hmm. then as a player. Yeah. It sounds like you were in the right place at the right time. And, and, and as you mentioned, that kind of growing love affair, I think that it's really interesting, isn't it, how psyche just puts us on a path sometimes to certain things. And what we maybe initially, when we put our foot on that path, we have no idea, we can't possibly see what's coming around the next corner. And then the next thing you know, here you are. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, but it's clear that you've had a love for depth psychology, analytical psychology, union psychology for a long, long time. You've had a long career as a union analyst. I wonder if you can share a little bit about your own thoughts on how you, you had mentioned the diversity piece and how you feel like depth psychology or analytical psychology has been expanding and growing in, in new and different directions. And I really love to see that too. It's, it's a sense that it's getting out into the world in, in some new and different ways. So I wonder if you can share a little bit about how how you see the benefits of depth psychology. What can it do for us? What appeals to you personally, maybe, about that as well? Well, there's several dimensions to that. I, I think we're in the midst of a major paradigm shift, not just in psychology, but across really all disciplines. And, you know, I've framed it, uh, one way of framing it that I've been particularly drawn to has been around complexity theory and the idea of a, a kind of new holistic approach to systems that ultimately I think comes out of a kind of an ecological understanding of the world. And I think the unique place for depth psychology there is the connection between the inner and outer worlds, what Jung would have called the psychoid, which I now begin to see much more in ecological terms. And that um, it's about the nature of reality. It's the, the, the old Cartesian divisions between subjective and objective and so forth. As valuable as they've been and as much as they give us tools to understand a lot of aspects of the world, we've reached a lot of the limits there. And in so many, um, whether it's in sciences or the humanities, so many of the advances that are occurring right now are about exploring the... Um, the interactions between things and the in growing knowledge of the interconnectedness of everything and the whether it's it's about forest ecology or um you know the way in which the academic disciplines ultimately engage with one another the provenance of ideas where they've come from um, and the way in which then that becomes lived in the world and it takes us to things like social and environmental justice. But once we realize the interconnectedness of things, I think, and we see the depth connection that really does provide the weave, the, the rhizome, as it were, that brings us into those kind of connections, then the issues of what is justice from a depth perspective requires us to take a look at the environment of social systems and so forth, that we can't separate ourselves from the other so simply. That, that kind of old modeling whether it's at a cultural level or an individual level, just be is beginning to break down. And I think that's where depth psychology and its interest in the margins actually continues to hold a pioneering component to it. No longer about just exploring the individual psyche, but really more of these kind of larger connections. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's so critical. It's this whole idea, I think, of being inclusive rather than exclusive and opening our arms in some ways to all of the disciplines. I really love the idea of an interdisciplinary psychology. And so your, your illustration of this as an ecological process, as a systems process is really important. And I know that that's been a, a huge piece of your work over the years. And I, I also think that that, I mean, if I may say so, it, it seems like a really important aspect to hold as you take the helm of, of a big ship <laughs> such as this one is. I wonder, can you say more about how you might 
address that as you move forward with Pacifica and begin to put some of these pieces in place that you're thinking about and envisioning right now? Well, one of the first things I did when I came here, um, the provo as provost, I host a weekly meeting of the, all the chairs of the different departments in the fundamentally nine programs. And so all the chairs get together and we discuss the business of the organization from an academic perspective. And one of my first queries to them was, what does depth psychology look like to you from your lens as we move into the 21st century? What do you see as the edge? And of course, what we found over a series of a number of weeks is that each one presented a rather different perspective. And it was really wonderful to hear the, the increasingly broad range of possibilities where people were coming from and the, the kinds of possibilities that open up for research. That was one of the things that, one of the directions I want to go with, with Pacifica is to develop a research center here and to really think about how we do these kinds of new forms of research to get out of our, our silos. It also means engaging more with the local community, whether that be, the, say, the uh, fire department or um, its other universities that we, or the city planners, that we begin to engage with them and bring the kind of resources we have through our students, through our faculty, into engagement in those communities. I think that's the way we can take the depth perspective and have it not just heard by others, but it has to be experienced to some degree. Yeah, it sounds like it, it, it's really expanding the idea of, of what Pacifica has been doing and building on that in so many ways, but this also feels like a, a new kind of flavor, and it's something I've noticed in the last few years growing at Pacifica, this involvement with community, this idea that we would want to, again, invite, you know, all kinds of different people. So it comes back to the whole piece about diversity, and that... Yes. That is such a critical topic on our planet right now, the diversity piece and how we can work together and welcome these new and different ways of thinking. Um, do, you have, do you have ideas around, well, first I, I want to go back to what you mentioned about the research. Do you have ideas around what that research might look like as a more of a concrete kind of level? And then maybe also um, what those, those involving the community might look like, just so that we have some examples to talk about. Sure, yeah. Um, well, I, each one of the programs, part of the vision was to say something about the kinds of research that they would themselves be interested in. And so the idea is to, be, to begin to very seriously consider building a research center where our faculty would be able to hold dual appointments and be able to conduct research and get grants and so forth and bring in outside researchers and that our students could be research associates and research fellows started a postdoctoral program so that we're getting input from people from a variety of other different disciplines, whether it's neuroscience or whether it's some kind of social city planning. And let's take a few examples. You know, there's the Global Dreaming Initiative. Uh, a research center could very easily build up a database of dreams from around the world, tens of thousands of dreams that would not be hard to put together. And then that could be data mined for all kinds of useful things that would also give us a sense of trying to capture something about the anima mundi, soul of the world. I mean, how is that? I mean, you, you really need something larger to begin to get a glimpse of that. I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think this would be the kind of steps that would take us in that direction and potentially hold a kind of a, a new larger vision that we could begin to work collectively towards. I think in terms of the community, I'm interested in things like being, it, having more involvement from veterans, of having interaction with, uh, just was at a meeting with perhaps the fire department where they're talking about when they go out on emergency one calls that many of those have a, a mental health component to it and to begin to help train people to be able to know how to respond appropriately and where to direct things so that not everything just ends up back in the, in the emergency room of a hospital using up a lot of resources that the community that's very precious and the community needs more access to. So to also doing some kind of joint projects. We're looking at several projects with some of the departments, for example, at UCSB, maybe something in the art history and religious studies departments, where there may be some overlapping in both teaching and running conferences together, to 
some neuroscience projects and maybe uh, some creativity explorations with people doing research in various other fields that we would train people in a depth psychological perspective to go into research labs and begin to understand the creative process a little better through a depth lens. Uh, there's a bit of research out there that's beginning like that. I think we could make a wonderful contribution to. Uh, there's certainly the field work that uh, both in the somatics program and in the uh, community liberation and ecology programs are, it's already underway. And I think that could also be brought into a kind of research dimension in some ways, not only field work for the students, but actually to make it full-fledged PhD research for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love all this. I think what's really exciting and inspiring for me to hear you talk about it is that it has definitely a hands-on kind of quality to it. You know, several of those projects that you talked about are about people getting out into the community and interacting and being able to bring whatever knowledge and understanding they've gained through their time at Pacifica uh, out into the community and then hopefully have some kind of impact and then whatever comes back from that will be brought back into the fold, so to speak, and, and be able to pollinate really on a, on a whole new different level those who, who are in the organization itself. So de definitely a systems idea when, when I start looking at it from that standpoint. Yeah. And there's a bi-directionality of influence. Absolutely. That's, that's very much a part of it. And some of these may be certificate programs. So it isn't that people have to go through a whole PhD training. Some of these things can be offered to the community in sort of more uh, smaller, more perhaps digestible um, uh, bits for them. Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and also, again, it's that idea of, of hands-on. And so being able to actually do something that applies the knowledge and learning. I think that one of the challenges for depth psychology for the longest time, and when I say depth psychology, of course, I, I include union psychology, analytical psychology uh, under that umbrella, but All of that. I, I think one of the challenges for the longest time has been that it, that it has been somewhat academic and or can be really kept on a very academic level. And so there is a real need to be able to open up and, and bring this kind of experiential, hands-on, interactive approach to it. Yeah, it's, I, I think its, it's origins were um, on the margins of the university, and there had been this longing to bring it in, but the university itself has undergone an enormous transformation in the last 120 years, and it's changing now. I mean, if you study higher ed, uh, a bit, it's, you know, we're talking about moving away from simple uh, lecture format. I mean, we're looking at use of mixed reading, much more experiential kind of in-classroom uh, learnings that are not based in the old model. So what scholarship is going to become as we move into the 21st century is I think itself going to be transformed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Well, if that, if that is one of the challenges that depth psychology is facing uh, as a general institution or, or field, are there others that you can think of that are challenges that actually are presenting themselves that we need to be looking at and addressing? Yeah, I think there are several things. I mean, some of it is at the cultural level, and I think it's about education, that um, one of the values in depth psychology, no matter which one of the traditions you draw upon, is that there is a willingness to not know, to, to be able to tolerate not knowing, the uncertainty to become curious about that, and that requires some ability to slow down. And so you can't be constantly only on your you know, smartphone texting and what have you, because if, if everything is moving at that pace, there isn't a way to get a reflective function into that. I don't think it means having to just disconnect from the world to then go into some reflective space, but we need to evolve a way of building a reflective capacity into the, our, our engagement. And I think, you know, at the level of research, it's, it's a way of thinking together. You know, that's part of what, where the, how do we slow down and become curious enough about one another and the way in which we're approaching things that, that it won't be just simply, I'm doing research on this topic, but that there's a whole interaction with other researchers, but also with the topic itself and the substance of whatever that is. It will get us beyond the, in quote, evidence-based only kind of thing. As valuable as that can be, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't speak to soul very easily. And the, the question is how to reanimate. I think that's one of the, we're, you know, we're against a kind of cultural uh, 
move that wants to uh, hasten breathing, except that this move towards a holistic perspective is regaining a great interest. And so studying those processes, I think, is one way to help people become curious again, really to begin to identify the patterns and the trajectories of those patterns that we're all within or inside of rather than being on the outside of. And that, I think, will be one of our challenges, how to do that. Mm -hmm. I must admit, I was at a WASC meeting recently, and we were given a, I was in a, a group about potential futures for higher education. The, that was the theme of the, uh, the session, and they divided us up into a bunch of groups, and they gave us some potential futures, most of them were dystopic, you know, they were, you know, so, and so I was in one of the sort of a cyber uh, pharmaceutical kind of, uh, uh, you know, you take pills and you, you use all kinds of uh, computer and robot assistance to, to educate yourself. And as we got talking about it, the, the, the thing that became most apparent to me and what I commented on was that the whole model was predicated on a cognitive approach. You know, that everything was, you know, you're going you're gonna to get smarter and you're going to process knowledge. And there was no sense of the emotional side of things, as if there wasn't wisdom in the affect. And as I started to talk about that, the man next to me was um, an academic from a, another institution not related to depth psychology. He said, he turned to me and he said, well, you know, I believe in soul. And I hadn't used the word. I, I was just really taken back by that. I thought, wow, it's there. It, you just get a little below the surface and there it is. And so I think there's a more hunger and more interest for that. And it is what is the one antidote to a dystopian future. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love that because as soon as you start talking about it, or as soon as you start embodying it, both here right now, actually, I'm experiencing it as well, but also clearly in that story that you just told, it begins to manifest, or maybe it's always there, I guess is probably the way that most depth psychologists would look at it. And of course, we just start to become aware of it. It's the noticing, isn't it? Yeah, it starts to emerge. It yeah. comes from below. Yeah. Yeah. And you've been using words like reflection and reanimation and, of course, anima mundi, one of my favorite words of all time. And so as a, you know, for myself as a professional who is very cognizant of soul most of the time, I still find myself caught often, way too often in the everyday world and what's going on on the planet ecologically as well as politically. We have so many um, things that might be perceived as threats right now. If you turn on the news for five minutes, that's all you have to do before you just begin to get quite overwhelmed, on, for many of us at least. And I'm, I'm wondering if you see a way to invoke soul, as we've been talking about, and in order to help address some of those issues in the world. So can you say something about how you would envision Pacifica's role in what's going on on the planet and on all of those fronts that we just mentioned and also how we might begin to engage with with pacifica's ideas and thoughts which of course are very aligned with depth psychology uh, on that front yeah I, I think i would start with um the notion of soul or psyche uh you know we trace it back to its you know, pre-Socratic Greek roots, back to Homer and so forth. That's one tradition. Of course, there are indigenous traditions everywhere in the world that recognize something of this level of being, this more holistic approach. And I say that because I think the move towards a new holism and, you know, like I said, by, through complexity, begins to touch on that. It begins to say, this is, if we're going to move forward, we need something that allows us to, to really more deeply understand the complexity of things, the, the way they're interconnected, and that that's also where soul is. It, it isn't separate from that. It's part of the increasing complexity, and our understanding of that complexity is, for me, an increased understanding of where the soul is. It's, it's the richness. I mean, for example, I studied forest ecosystems for a while, and the kind of the way the root systems through the fungi get interconnected is it's just mind blowing. I mean, I know there's been several recent publications about this. And when you read into that, you realize, my goodness, you're looking at an entity that is, you know, many, many acres and involves hundreds, if not thousands of different distinct beings, all in a connected net. Well, that's the soul of the place when you start to see that larger vision. And we haven't had the kind of scientific tools 
to articulate this before. We've done it through an intuition. And uh, I'm very fond of that intuition. It's, I think much of learning to work with dreams, for example, is a way of really developing the skills of using that intuition to see patterns and, and to begin to identify that. But what, how wonderful to marry it to um, other ways of, of knowing the world. Again, this is where I think the subjective and objective um, divisions begin to break down. Now we're starting to look at a kind of way in which the way we envision soul, the way we see it, has a, a richness and complexity both at a scientific and at a cultural and literary and a personal dimension. And the, that's one of the ways where I see Pacifica really carrying this forward, that as we articulate these different levels out and begin to work and do research on these kinds of places in the psyche, that we really speak to soul in and of the world in that way. Yeah. Yeah, and I would add one thing to that. I completely agree with you, and I think that this is there's so much potentiality in that approach, in that attitude, and, and that's what's really inspiring. And I would also add that I see personally Pacifica the physical entity and the idea of Pacifica as almost a refuge, a place where people can go and tap back into that soul if we get a little bit too crazy in our daily lives. You know, whether it's just going to one of the programs or whether it's enrolling in, in it as a full-time student or whether it's touching back with alumni, all of those things offer so many opportunities and so many resources for people who are struggling, even, or, or even if you just, you know, need something in the moment to, to kind of touch you back into that soul. Well, you know, that's one of the things that we were, we're going to make a, a concerted effort this year to use our, our formerly our introduction days, which are, you know, a, a way of helping people come to Pacific and find out about us, but also to invite in, in, a, in a more extended way, our, our alumni and even current students, starting with more salons from a wide range of people who bring in different kinds of ideas, like Philip Cushman was here, and to... Um, have speakers address a number of topics. You both have an experience of the classroom, but you also get a, a sense of what is the range. And we're going to do a lot more with student services and building up careers. I, I think it's really important that we start to think about helping people imagine careers going forward. I just read a piece on the future of work, and th this was from something from the Chronicle of Higher Education, and I was really struck by their conclusion. They said the future of work lies in two areas, creativity and empathic capacities. And I thought, my goodness, that's really close to the heart of Pacifica. Mm -hmm. Some of what we sell at, what psychology goes directly to those things. It is an empathy that goes far beyond the ego, beyond the kind of uh, just getting to know the, the superficial level. It goes into the great depth and knowing the parts of the psyche, and that's the wellspring of creativity. Yeah, absolutely, and to aspire to that, I mean, we can only do what we can do, but to have that aspiration, I can only imagine if more people on this planet were aspiring to those two particular things. Yeah, and so what we're going to do is then build a series of introduction days. They're going to be thematically woven together, and people are going to be invited to come as often as they'd like. Maybe if they want to sign up for two or three of them, there will be ways to make that even less expensive for them. And the idea would be, and also for alumni to be a part of that. We did it as a two and a half day event, and a number of alumni came, and they talked about what you said, about really wanting to touch back in and really reconnect with that experience. Looking for ways to really offer it more fully is one of the things that's really in my mind at this point. Yeah, it also gives alumni a chance to give back, too. You know, if they've had an amazing experience, like most of them that I talk to, there, there's this urge, I think, on for many of us on some level to be able to give back to people who have yet to discover all of the amazing things that, you know, Pacifica has, the magic that's there. Well, as you know, there's an ambassador program now for the alumni, and I, I think our alumni are our best ambassadors. I think they, because they've lived through it, they know it from the inside, just as a kind of an idea. and. There's something very wonderful about, we had a panel of alumni on Sunday. And it was just, I, I just was so thrilled and impressed by the complexity and range of things that they brought forward in terms of how they're living this in their lives. Each one quite different, very distinct. Six different views that really 
covered a wide, wide range of careers and experiences. Yeah, that's great. I'm so happy to hear that, and, and I can only imagine. Along those same lines, Joe, of, of just making Pacifica really a place for soul, I know that there has been a movement toward something that is now being called the retreat. Do you want to just say a few words about that, what that is, and how you envision that moving forward? Sure. Well, several things have happened in the last year or two. There were some changes in the physical structures of, of uh, Pacifica and on, on our Ladera campus. Some rooms became available for, um, you know, guest rooms for overnighting. And so we refurbished those and have produced a series of deluxe suites out of those. And at the same time, we decided we really wanted to move more in the direction of a retreat with a whole um, more themed programmatic focus. And so we've been in the process of building up um, beyond public programs, which was a vibrant thing for many, many years. But now the idea is to have retreats, which allows us to do more certificates, allows us to have people coming back multiple times in a year to go more deeply into particular kinds of projects. For example, we have Don Kelshed coming and doing a thing on trauma over a series of four extended stays. So people can really enter in at great depth. We have another one on writing memoirs. We're going to have another one on depth mentoring. And these will involve a chance for more sustained involvement here in the community so that people can come and get a chance to really uh, explore something that's really central to them. I think we're looking at building more connections with our archives so that people can come here and study in our archives. We, that's been growing, and that's linking up with the Retreat Center. We've also been putting together a series of conferences and events through the Retreat Center that some of them are engaging more with the local community. That's part of our desire to go through that. and. Um, really, I think the vision is to have Pacifica have a component where people can come here in, in that way to step outside of the sort of the pressures of their everyday life and really have a chance to dive deep into something that's really meaningful and important to them. Yeah. That, that's great. I think that's such a lovely offering and wonderful direction to be going. So, Joe, you've only been in the seat for a few weeks now. You're, you're brand new at this. What are the surprises? What surprised you about the, the new role? Well, you know, I, I, w I had been in the role of acting president from February until now. And I thought from that that I had a fairly good grasp of things. And from the stewardship side of it, I think, yes, I, that, that was really where my focus and energy was, was keeping things ruddered and on track and so forth. Um, but now as the president CEO, the, the kind of need for the vision to step forward and to really begin to become uh, the innovator and leading the team is, is really growing. And I think that's it's exciting and it's a big challenge. Um, there are so many moving parts <laughs> that, um, you know, keeping tabs on all those and really learning to build uh, the team. I really feel very strongly that... Uh, the team I have is really crucial to me. Uh, I look to them for th their input and their advice and, you know, the way in which they know how to do things on the ground to advise me. And then I have a, a team of senior advisors that help me shape the kind of direction in, con in connection with the board. So it's really uh, like being a conductor. I think there's, uh, and it's like the, the kind of music we're conducting is getting increasingly complex more and more parts and more and more uh, uh, elements to the symphony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a beautiful image though. I really, really yeah. appreciate that. How do you, as we begin to come to a close here, Joe, I'm really curious about how you personally maintain soul in the face of all this. You mentioned it's nine programs across two campuses. It's very fast moving. There's a lot of moving pieces going on. How do you, do you have personal practices that you can share? Yes, I do. Sure I do. I mean, that's from working as an analyst over many, many years. I have my morning routines. I, I really do make sure that I get a physical exercise and psychological exercise before I even begin my work day, because uh, that sustains me. And then um, I take I take time out during the day. Sometimes it's with 
colleagues here and where we sit down and just talk about something meaningful and important to them. Sometimes it's a, about the content of what's actually happening that needs to be taken care of, but other times it's about larger issues, about the vision of the place. You know, the questions somebody may raise about non-duality, non maybe a topic of conversation in, in one place or another. The excitement of having um, the, the community of people here to engage with at all different levels, I think that sustains me. It's, it, and when I go home at night, I often find myself taking a little bit of meditative time to, to really locate where I've been through the course of the day. And that, it pr provides another course correction. Yeah, yeah, well, that sounds really great. And it's really lovely to hear all of the plans and the ideas that are in the, in the direction that you're moving in. I'm really, again, just thrilled to know that you are at the helm now and it's going to be a, an exciting and wild ride, I'm pretty sure. But I think that it's one that the community will benefit from greatly. and. I know that you also will still have the benefit of Steve Eisenstadt's input and a number of people who have been so uh, obviously critical and central to running Pacifica. So they're not going very far away, I'm sure, but, but it's really wonderful to see the, the new leadership coming in and, and to hear about all the ideas and visions that you have. You know, the one thing I didn't discuss is in terms of our immediate future, there is one other component that I think is important to just mention, and that is the international aspect of, of Pacifica. I've been in some negotiations very recently and it looks like we're probably going to have a satellite campus in China where the pilot program is, is beginning to be put into place. We're not quite there yet, but the, the idea is that we will be working with colleagues from many different cultures. This is part of the network, but this Pacifica here in Carpinteria and Santa Barbara will be the main hub, but that we'll have um, satellite campuses in different parts of the world. And we will try to gear things into their languages and to their cultures and the kind of myths and, and rituals and folklore and whatever that, that's prevalent there, that we will work with them to extend Pacifica and the Pacific Division into a kind of global network. Oh, that's so exciting. I really enjoy hearing that. And I think that there's so much application for that as we move forward. Again, just this idea of really making depth psychology more applied and being able to get it into the hands of people who have the opportunity to then take it and, and pay it forward in so many ways. Yeah, right. All within their own cultural context. Yeah, I think that's a really important new direction. And it is inclusive. I mean, that's, it's, it's also wanting to really expand the diversity and inclusivity. Well, thank you so much again, Joe. I've been speaking with Joe Cambry, who is the new president and CEO at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your schedule to be with me oh, today. Pleasure, Bonnie. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Learn more at PacificaPost.com or at Pacifica.edu.